Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Our, web, our webinar will begin in a few minutes. Uh, while you're waiting, feel free to review our OSHA program information at csudh.edu forward slash OSHA. Welcome, my name is Raul Guzman. I'm director of the OSHA Training Institute Education Center here at the California State University, Dominguez Hills. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our web website and social media uh, for uh, shortly. So this session is being presented in a webinar format, so you won't need to worry about connecting your microphone or camera. Participation is highly encouraged. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you are joining us from Zoom desktop app or web browser, or find it at the top right of your screen if you are on a mobile device. Once you click the Q&A button, a dialog box will open allowing you to type your questions. Please ask your questions in the Q&A panel rather than in the chat panel. In the chat panel, we will provide links to resources and other information. My colleagues, Giselle DeAnda, Anissa Barton Thompson, Stephanie Biukian, and Keith Otterberg are standing by to assist with questions. We will be answering your questions at the end of the session. 
although often you may find that your question may be answered during the presentation. Today, our main pres presentation will be about suicide prevention in the workplace, followed by a Q&A session. But before we get started, I would like to share some information regarding our OSHA Education Center. Uh, OSHA Education Centers are part of the are part of OSHA's Office of Training and Education. They are part of a national network of nonprofit organizations uh, authorized by OSHA to deliver OSHA numbered courses. Most of the centers are assigned to higher education institutions, and there are 26 centers throughout the country. Uh, we offer more than 50 different courses in occupational safety and health. OSHA has two certificate programs, and the California State University Dominguez Hills offers six different certificate programs in occupational safety and health. We are here today because September is Suicide Prevention Month, and it's important to recognize that work related stresses can have a severe impact on mental health. Without proper support, this can lead to suicide. Work suicides are particularly concerning for the construction industry. The suicide rate for construction workers is four times higher uh, than in the general population, due in large part to work-related stresses such as seasonal work, demanding schedules, and work injuries that could lead to a high consumption of opioids. This is an issue that deeply deeply impacts workers, their families, and our communities. Ahead of the Construction Suicide Prevention Week, the Assistant Secretary of Labor, Doug Parker, has a message to share about the importance of suicide prevention and breaking the stigma around mental health in the construction industry. Hello, I'm Doug Parker, Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health. I want to talk to you about a critically important topic, suicide. Suicide is a leading cause of death among working age adults in the United States. It deeply impacts workers, families, and communities. In 2020, more than 45,000 Americans died from suicide. That same year, there were 1.2 million suicide attempts. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, nearly one in five adults live with a mental condition, such as anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress. There is no single cause for suicide, but we know that work-related stress and work-related medical conditions can significantly impact mental health and lead to increased risk of substance abuse or even suicide. Because of this, we see much higher rates of suicide in some industries than in others. Construction is one of those industries. The rate of suicide for construction workers is four times higher than the general population. Work-related stress from seasonal or inconsistent work, demanding schedules, and work-related injuries are all risk factors that could lead to suicidal thoughts. Mental health and suicide may be difficult to talk about, especially with work colleagues. But you are not alone. If you are having trouble coping with work-related stress, or if anything is giving you a feeling of hopelessness and you are having suicidal thoughts, it is critical that you get help now. Call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 or join the chat online at 988lifeline.org backslash chat. When you work closely with someone, you may sense when something is wrong. If you are concerned about a coworker, talk with them privately and listen without judgment. If you believe a coworker is in immediate risk of suicide, stay with them until you can get further help. Contact emergency services or call 988 for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you are an employer, Show your workers that you care about their overall health and safety, including their mental well-being. Promote mental health awareness 
and eliminate barriers to getting help. Suicides are preventable. Visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, www.afsp.org, to learn more about suicide risk factors, warning signs, and what you can do to help prevent suicide. Mental health is part of overall health. That is why the U.S. Department of Labor and OSHA are deeply committed to supporting the mental health of all workers, just as we are committed to protecting them from physical hazards on the job. We are proud to join with the many individuals and organizations across the country to recognize September as Suicide Prevention Month, the week of September 5th through 9th as Construction Suicide Prevention Week. I want to thank OSHA's Kansas City Regional Office and their partners for their work on this important topic. It is truly life-saving. And thank you all for being part of this effort to prevent suicide. So at this time, I would like to welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Makisha Buffalo, psychological counselor within the Student Psychological Services at the California State University, Dominguez Hills, who will share some information about suicide prevention in the workplace. Uh, now we would like to turn things over to Dr. Buffalo. Good afternoon. So I'm Dr. Makisha Buffalo. Once again, I am a psychological counselor in student psychological services here at Dominguez Hills. If I can get the controls, please. Uh, continue with your intro, and then we have Dr. Uh, Ms. Laura afterward. And so I would like to allow my colleague to introduce herself as she will be moderating some of the questions in the chat as well. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Josephine Lara. I serve as a mental health educator at Cal State Dominguez Hills and I work along with my colleague, Dr. Makisha Buffalo. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over so she can uh, take us to the um, presentation. Um, one thing um, though, before I do transition it over to Dr. Buffalo, I will serve as a moderator. So if you do have any uh, questions, as um, Raul mentioned earlier in the introduction, please ensure that you put it in the Q&A. Do not put it in the chat. We'll try to make the chat uh, feature to be more of engaging interaction um, kind of piece. Um, but please, any questions that you all have, feel free to put it in the uh, Q&A. And I'll ensure that um, either myself um, or someone else from the panel um, answer some of them. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So let's talk about suicide prevention. So before we get started, I just wanna acknowledge that this can be a very challenging and difficult conversation and topic to cover. And so anytime throughout the presentation, if you feel like you need to take a step away to take care of yourself, please do so. And so what I'd like for us all to do at this point is place your hand over your heart. Can you feel it? That is called purpose. You're alive for a reason, so don't give up. Today, I'm gonna go over general statistics, um, suicide risk factors, protective factors. We'll watch a couple of videos as well as do a few vignettes together. I'll talk about some suicide risk screening tools, safety, talk about some resources, and then we'll leave time for questions and answers. And so to anyone out there that is hurting, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's a sign of strength from former President Barack Obama. Some general statistics about suicide. These are based on the CDC's research. The age-adjusted suicide rate in 2020 was 13.48 per 100,000 individuals. The rate of suicide is highest in middle-aged white men. In 2020, men died by suicide 3.8 times more than women. On average, there are 130 suicides per day. White males account for almost 70% of deaths by suicide in 2020. And in 2020, firearms accounted for over 50% of all suicides and death or death by suicides. So suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States. In 2020, almost 46,000 individuals died by suicide. 
In addition, as was mentioned in the video earlier, in 2020, 1.2 million individuals attempted suicide. For every death by suicide, there are four hospitalizations for suicide attempts, eight emergency department visits related to suicide, 27 self-reported suicide attempts, and 275 people who are seriously considering suicide. So as you can see, the numbers are progressively increasing. So I really want to take a moment to acknowledge the age of which people are at the highest risk of suicide. So as you can tell, 25 to 35 you know, that's 18.4, which equates to 8,454 people who are considering attempting suicide, right? And so if you continue to go up that ladder, 35 to 45, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, that is really the working class. And if you combine those numbers, it's roughly about 50,000 individuals in the working field that are attempting suicide and are really at risk um, for suicide and suicidal ideation. So we really want to, you know, address that topic. We really want to talk to individuals who are in those age groups because they're very vulnerable. And so as you can tell, suicide rates have increased 36% between 2000 and 2018. There was a decline about 5% between 2018 and 2020. However, I would imagine that between the next time they do the research and polls between 2020 and 2024, I would imagine that would have gone up because of the pandemic. And that was a very stressful time for a lot of families, a lot of individuals. And so I imagine we'll see that sort of curve increasing once again. And so is there a gender difference? I do want to acknowledge on this slide that it doesn't account for um, trans identified folks or you know, gender non-conforming individuals. So it does only account for those individuals who identify as male and female. But as you can see, there's almost like a four times risk for male identified individuals in terms of suicide attempts and also suicide by death, death by suicide. And so some of the disparities in suicide, suicide risk is higher within the LGBTQ community. So 23.4% of high school students who identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual reported attempting suicide in the prior or the past 12 months. This rate is four times higher than the rate among heterosexual students, which was about 6.4. Suicide rates are also higher among veterans. So veterans have an adjusted suicide rate that is 52.3% greater than non-veterans or civilian adult population. People who have previously served in the military also account for about 13.7% of suicides in the US. So if you think about male, white, if you've had previous experience in the military, if you also identify with the LGBTQ community, then your risk of suicide is continuously increasing um, based on those novelties and minority statuses. Suicide is higher among people with disabilities. Adults with disabilities were three times more likely to report suicidal ideations in the past month compared to people who do not have a disability. Additionally, so when we look at this chart, you know, it shows 23.9 um, for non-Hispanic American Indian Alaskan natives. However, if you think about population size, they're actually the second largest group that are at risk. The 6.9 16.9 is for white identified individuals or not Hispanic white identified individuals who are the highest group and are at risk for suicide. So does your occupation increase your risk of suicide? This is based on the 2020 CDC study found that suicide rates among workers in certain industries was significantly greater than the general US population. Amongst these, these were the top five was mining, construction for males, which was 45.3, other services, whether that's automobile repair, agriculture, transportation. So those were the top five. And then they, did, they further investigated and found that suicide rates was also greater than the general population for the following major occupational groups, construction and extraction. You know, Females were 25.5 per 100,000. Males were 49.4 per 100,000. Installation, maintenance, and repair, additionally. 
art, design, entertainment, sports and media, transportation, protective services, and healthcare support. But actually, if you look at the top two in this particular um, example, is you see that there's a big discrepancy between construction and say healthcare support, right? There's about a four time difference. And so what are the suicide risks? Like what are the things that we can look out for within our colleagues, but also within ourselves if we are experiencing some of these things? And so I've broken it down into sort of four categories um, that allows you to kind of identify risks, but also warning signs. So category number one, talking about, so if the individual is talking about wanting to die or even posting things on their social media that imply wanting to die or death, that they're a burden to others, or that maybe they're experiencing sort of great or grave guilt and shame or embarrassment. Maybe they've expressed feelings of emptiness, hopelessness, feeling trapped, or not having a reason to live. Or they may have experienced some emotional pain and suffering. Maybe there's been a recent loss or there's grief happening in the family. Also things to look out for are behavioral changes, right? So is the person socially isolating? Are there prior suicide attempts? Have they noticed any appetite changes? You know, are they researching ways in which they can commit suicide? Are they taking risks, whether that's you know, excessively driving or are they giving things away? You know, another factor that you really wanna consider when you're thinking about suicidal ideation, but also those that are at risk for attempting and committing suicide is, is there a history of mental health, whether that's depression, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, serious or chronic pain and illness, you know, substance use, are there any crim criminal or legal problems that may be arising? This is just another way of looking at what sort of, sort of the things that I was just talking about. So you want to think about like, what are the warning signs? Are they, or is there substance use? Is there aggressiveness or irritability? Do they have possession of lethal means, firearms? What are, what are people talking about? What are your relationships like in the work environment? So that you can kind of tell if there have been changes in whether it's the communication style, their behavior, or just their overall demeanor. And so when we identify risk factors, I always like to combat that with what are some protective factors? What are things that if the person has, they're less likely to commit suicide, they're less likely to attempt it. And so I wanna break these down into three different categories on the individual level, community protective factors, as well as on the societal level. And so on an individual level, having effective coping skills and problem solving skills, whether that's spending time with friends, you know, journaling, mindfulness, those are healthy, identifiable coping skills. Reasons for living, family, friends, maybe they're taking care of pets. Um, do they have a strong sense of cultural identity? Support, do they have a support system? Are they feeling connected to others? When we're feeling connected to others, we're less likely to engage in high risk, but also suicidal ideations, as well as attempts community protective factors, feeling connected to one's community, to your job, but also to a social institution such as a church community, an organization, a club, um, availability and or access to consistent high quality physical and behavioral or mental health services. Are people being connected? Societal protective factors, reducing access to lethal means, oftentimes that's firearms, but that could also mean sharp objects, um, old prescription medications, things of that nature. Once again, cultural, religious, or even moral obligations to suicide. Oftentimes, when people are, may have a religious background, they're less likely to commit and or attempt suicide. And so this is just another way of looking at things. And I really, if you kind of look at the image on the right, I really enjoy this one because it kind of breaks it down based on ethnicity and racial identification groups. And so for example, within Asian and Pacific Islanders, seeking help from native healers, right? This also you know, can cross over with Native American and Alaskan natives, really going to their elders, encouraging them to connect with their spirituality, their cultural identity. Connectedness is so important for any individual with regardless of ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, 
or lifestyle, right? We can all find a place of connectedness and identity and how that can be a positive protective factor. Now, before we get into the two videos, I do wanna um, take a moment to say, you know, these videos may be triggering. Um, therefore, if you do find that you are having an emotional or physiological reaction and you need to step away, please do so once again. The most important thing is you taking care of yourself and knowing when to join in, when to step back. And so I just want to give sort of a trigger warning before we get into these next two videos. Less than one third of Americans are happy with their jobs. One industry plagued with mental illness and suicides is construction. That industry sees four times the number of suicides as the general population, making it the highest of any industry. King 5's Jake Wittenberg shows us a new program that's trying to help. When Brett Eno's mother died by suicide when he was just 12, he was left scared and confused. When I was a little kid, I thought somebody had to murder my mom because <laughs> there's no way I could accept that she committed suicide on her own, would leave us kids alone. Heavy stuff for a kid to handle. He kept all of that bottled up inside. Over time, it took its toll. Eventually, as a tough construction worker diagnosed with manic depression, Enos never felt he could share his feelings, instead taking up woodworking and painting to stay sane. I go through the depression where I want to sit there and get rid of everything and go into the woods and just be out there all by myself or go down in California and live underneath a pier. Those feelings can often lead to suicide. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control finds 53 out of every 100,000 construction workers like Enos will die by suicide. So is it therapy? One reason Enos is out to help through one program called Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. It's the next frontier in safety. Cal Byer helped start the program to save lives in his industry. Contractors learn how to spot and address suicidal warning signs among their workers. There's a pent up need and it shows me that the construction industry really does care about employees and that if we can bring them tools and resources, it will make a difference. That's what Brett Enos is hoping for too, to help fellow construction workers build themselves up rather than letting mental illness tear them down. It will open the eyes to the employers that, hey, sometimes, you know, somebody needs to seek help. They, they need that time now, not later, because there might not be a later. That's just one of the many stories we'll be talking about this morning. But we want you to know your life matters to everyone around you, even people you've never met. Call this number, 1-800-273-8255. It is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So before I start the next video, just sort of allow yourself to take a breath because sometimes, you know, there can be triggering emotions that come up during the video. And so if we can all just breathe together. And then we'll show the next video. We have lost far too many lives traveling the path to this day. Since 1937, over 2,000 people have died at the Golden Gate Bridge. I feel lucky to be alive every single day. Of the thousands that have died off the Golden Gate Bridge, I am of the 1% who have survived. So I was born on drugs and premature. And then I bounced around from home to home. Nobody wanted to keep me because I was sick. And I got lucky. I landed in the home of Patrick and Deborah Hines. I had a great childhood. I thought growing up that everything's gonna be great. And then at 17, it, it all came crashing down. If you can imagine feeling that everyone around you is out to get you, trying to hurt you, and trying to kill you. And you believe that to be the truth. From the extreme paranoia, I exhibited symptoms of mania. From the mania came the hallucinations, both auditory and visual. And so with that and the bipolar disorder, I just was spiraling out of control. I vividly remember writing my suicide note. People don't get it. Like, I, I thought I was a burden. 
to everyone who loved me. Because that's what my brain told me, because that's how powerful your brain is. I got off the bus, I walked slowly down the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, people rode by me, drove by me, walked by me, and a woman approached me. And she said, will you take my picture? She said, thanks, and she walked away. It was that moment I just said, nobody cares. The reality was that everybody cared. I just couldn't see it. I ran forward, and using my two hands, I catapulted myself into free fall. What I'm about to say is the exact same thing that 19 Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors have also said. The millisecond my hands left the rail, it was an instant regret. And I remember thinking, no one's going to know that I didn't want to die. In four seconds, I fell 75 miles an hour, 25 stories, and I hit the water. Uh, I was in the most physical pain I had ever experienced. I have ever experienced. The Coast Guard was amazing. Uh, he was just so freaked out that I was alive that he just dove in and brought me on board. The guy said, do you know how many people we pull out of this water that are already dead? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. The guy put his hand on my forehead said, kid, you're a miracle. My father took one step into the hospital room, and I looked up at him, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, no, Kevin, I'm sorry. And if you think about it, both of our immediate reactions were guilt, guilt that didn't belong to either of us. And even though I didn't die, I caused people a great deal of grief and pain. Just the day of my attempt still sits within them today. I asked my father if he still feared my death by suicide. He said, every time the phone goes off, his first inclination, is Kevin alive? I had that impact on my dad. So after the jump, uh, the road to recovery was pretty long. I had seven psych ward stays in the next 11 years. I, I still have all the symptoms I ever had. Mania, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, all that's still there. I just know how to cope with it and I know how to beat it. I built a support network over these years of treatment so that I wouldn't be fighting this alone. So like, it's okay not to be okay. It's not okay not to ask for someone to back you up. To the families who, who live with the loss or losses of loved ones, they didn't do that to hurt you or destroy your life. They, they took their lives because they were struggling and in a great deal of emotional and mental pain. Suicide, mental illness, and addiction are the only diseases that we blame the person for perpetually. But people die from suicide just like they die from any other organ diseased. Today, no matter the pain I'm in, no matter the struggles I experience, I do believe that life is the greatest gift we've ever been given. And if you're suffering mentally, don't wait like I did sitting in denial for so long. Because recovery happens, living proof. And so before we move on to the vignettes, I often like to show that video because it really highlights, you know, what it, his experience is like going through the emotions, feeling like he can't ask for help. That's why it's so important to create those protective factors, to create a sense of community, to ask for help, to acknowledge that you're not okay, right? I think oftentimes people put on a front like everything's fine, but it really does take a lot of strength and courage to say, you know what, I actually, I just need support and I need additional resources and services. And so as you think about the vignettes that I'm going to read, think about whether or not this person is at risk for suicide. And then we'll, I'll read the second one, we'll think about the protective factors. So Juan has been working for a construction company for several years. Prior to the past 30 days, he has always been on time, upbeat and a great leader. However, five weeks ago, Juan lost a close friend to COVID-related complications, started talking about death, isolating himself from the group, gave one of his coworkers his, his tools, and started saying how easy it would be to disappear. Is Juan at risk for suicide?
And so right now we have about, you know, close to 77% of participants responding. We'll just wait a few more moments and then I'll kind of talk about the results. Okay, we'll, we'll end the poll at that point. So just based on the results, 89% of individuals said yes, 3% said no, and 8% said unsure, right? Oftentimes in these situations, it's hard to tell, right? And I think that, you know, that's why I crafted it this way, because sometimes just because someone is giving something away, we don't necessarily know why that's happening, but that's why it's really important to ask those additional questions, right? To be a support system, to notice like, is this completely a different behavioral change? Like what has happened in Juan's life that maybe is making me think there's something else here. There's a mental health concern. Maybe he is at risk, right? And so how about now? I'm gonna read it again, but there's gonna be a few modifications. Juan has been working for a construction company for several years. Prior to the past 30 days, he has always been on time, upbeat and a great leader. However, five weeks ago, Juan lost a close friend to COVID related complications, started talking about death, isolated himself from the group and gave one of his coworkers his tools. Juan is a dedicated father, husband, member of the Catholic church and leader in his community. What are his protective factors? So we'll take a few more moments and then we'll close the poll. Okay, so looks like we've reached about just shy of 70%. And so, you know, we'd love to see, you know, how people responded to the question. And so just to kind of highlight some of those protective factors, you know, being a father, being a husband, being a member of the Catholic Church, as well as a leader, right? So some of those things that, you know, we talked about earlier on is having that sense of community, right? Having people to whom you can connect with, but also, you know, having roots. Oftentimes when we're grounded, we feel more connected, we feel more alive because of the things that we're doing and the people that are in our lives. So I really appreciate everyone responding to the poll. And so now I want to take a moment to talk about some suicide risk screening tools that really, I think, provide some great questions that you can ask coworkers, colleagues, family, and friends. And so this is the suicide risk screening tool, the ASQ. One of the questions, and I'll go through all, 
um, five of the questions so that you have an idea of things that you could potentially ask someone if you're concerned about their mental health as well as their risk for suicide. In the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off if you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you been having thoughts about killing yourself? Have you ever tried to kill yourself? Are you having thoughts of killing yourself right now? If at any point the individual answers yes to any of these questions, you really wanna think about what resources can I provide them? Can I provide them the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which has been mentioned you know, numerous times today? Can I provide them the crisis text line if they don't necessarily wanna to talk to someone on the phone, but they do want the, a resource. So that's 741741. I'll also go over these resources once again towards the tail end of today's presentation. Now, this one isn't necessarily asking about suicide, but it is assessing for depression, which is often correlated and associated with higher risk of individuals who attempt and or commit suicide. And so some of the questions that can be asked are, you know, or even within yourself, you can do a self-assessment as well. Uh, little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down or depressed mood or hopelessness, you know, feeling tired or having low energy, changes in your appetite, whether that's under eating or overeating, you know, having trouble concentrating, you know, sort of that diminished focus, right? So if you see yourself on those sort of two and three area, it may be an indication, like maybe I do need to talk to a mental health professional, maybe, you know, a clergy, someone that a trusted individual that you can really share what you're going through, how you're experiencing life, but also, you know, perhaps consult with someone if you're having concerns about a family, friend, loved one, coworker. And so now we're gonna talk about safety. And I really love how they outline ways of kind of assessing for suicide, but also providing you sort of a guideline for how to intervene. And so SAFETY really stands for Suicide Assessment Five-Step Evaluation and Triage. So one, you want to identify those risk factors that we sort of talked about earlier. Are they talking about suicide? Are they, you know, expressing feelings of sadness, anxiety, stress? Um, what are the protective factors? Just like we identified, you know, are they connected to the community? Do they have a cultural identity that they are strongly committed to? You know, you want to conduct a suicide inquiry. It is okay to ask a direct question. I think oftentimes people get very anxious and nervous when thinking about like, well, I don't want to pry or I don't want to be emotionally intrusive, but I am concerned about their mental health. It is okay to ask someone, are you having thoughts of suicide? Or are you having thoughts of harming yourself or killing yourself? Oftentimes, just because a person thinks about harming themselves, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to kill themselves or that they want to die. Sometimes they just want a situation to go away, they want to escape, and they want someone to be able to offer them help because they're not sure how to ask for help. And so it is okay to ask that question. Determine the level of intervention. So what I would consider a high intervention is there's potentially a lethal suicide attempt or persistent ideation with strong intent or suicide rehearsal. This person is actively trying to commit suicide or making attempts and gestures towards that behavior. Moderate is having suicidal ideations with a plan, but this individual doesn't necessarily want to act on those thoughts. They're just thinking about it. And then low is sort of having thoughts of death. There's no plan, no intention, and there's no behaviors to indicate that they are at immediate risk for suicide. You want to sort of document this, let somebody know. Um, also, this card can be downloaded at this website, um, at the bottom of the page, so that you're able to sort of download the card, have it with you in the event that you find yourself in a situation where you might need to do an assessment of a friend, colleague, or loved one. So how to ask a coworker, family member, or friend um, about suicide. This is often times when people start to feel that immediate rush of anxiety. Um, but I also want to encourage all of you to just take a deep breath because really you want to lean into it. The only way to know is to ask. Oftentimes people are very nervous about asking, but like I was saying before, it really is important to ask the question because it may not be suicide, but they may need mental health resources. Know what your resources are. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 
there's a telephone number, but also 988. They're, they're currently in the process of sort of merging the two. Um, the crisis text line, once again, get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. It will feel uncomfortable to ask someone a direct question about their mental health, but it also may be like the one person that actually gets them to get connected. So create that safe space to have vulnerable conversations. Start with, I've noticed. I've noticed that you're showing up late to work every day. I've noticed that there's been changes in the way in which you talk with me. I've noticed your, you know, your tone of voice has shifted. I've noticed you've been more irritable, right? So you wanna come at from the position of, I'm noticing something that is different in you and I care about you. So I wanna find out you know, what's going on. Ask open-ended questions and direct questions and then practice active listening, right? You may be sort of a part of that lifeline to getting them connected, but also the, that individual feeling heard and feeling as if they matter. And so some resources um, that I would like to talk about are the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which we've mentioned numerous times. I really want to drill it in like this is a great resource to have. 988, sometimes the telephone number is harder to remember, but 988, you will still get the same information, the same access. The Crisis Text Line, 741-741. Oftentimes people do utilize this resource because they don't necessarily want people to hear them talking about sort of a mental health emergency or mental health crisis. So, so this is a great way to sort of have that confidentiality if you are out in public and you just really want to be able to gain um, connection with the provider. The Veterans Crisis Line. Um, so it's the same number as the National Suicide Prevention Hotline and Lifeline, but you press number one and they'll have specially um, individuals that can kind of cater to veterans. Also some community resources. And so, you know, all the ones that we talk about today, I would really encourage all of you to just sort of browse them, check them out for yourselves. Psychology Today is a great resource. Um, you can identify a provider based on your zip code, uh, gender preferences, type of, you know, services, whether it's you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, other different modalities. Additionally, you know, based on your insurance provider or out of network. So you can kind of specify and do filters from on there. Open Path Psychotherapy Collective is affordable in-person and online services. And so if you're really looking for affordable resources, this is a great resource to connect with. Also, when I would encourage everyone to download this because you never really know when you're going to need additional services. And this particular app, also has things like shelter if you're in need of shelter, food, health, legal. Um, and so if you go to when what I need um, in the search tab, put mental health, you'll have all of those resources. And it's based on your current location or you can change um, the location as to where you would like to find a provider. So now I'd like to take an opportunity for any questions and answers at this point. And I really appreciate everyone's attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Uh, Buffalo. I do see that we do have um, some questions that have already um, been uh, proposed, but you know, also keep in mind for all the audience, feel free to continue uh, writing your questions. Um, I'll be ensured to um, read them out loud and that way we can all hear the answers. So the first question that we do have here is, what do you recommend for, um, for someone who would like to engage in a conversation with a colleague, um, a coworker um, about suicide? Um, what do you recommend for them? How do they prepare themselves to engage in that conversation? Wonderful question. Um, I think the best way to prepare for the conversation is really to take a few deep breaths, really to like ground yourself prior to but also you wanna be able to pull that person aside. You know, there are some conversations that really do um, occur in a more open space if it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? So you wanna be really sensitive to the situation. You know, talk to the person, be able to have those resources available. I think, you know, oftentimes saying like, you know, I'm coming from a place of concern and care, right? Letting the person know like you care about them because oftentimes 
when people are concerned, the other person may feel attacked, right? And so they, their defenses may go up. And so you want to let the person know, like, I've noticed some changes, but I want to have this conversation in private, because what if they do disclose something that they don't want everyone to know, right? And so you want to have that conversation sort of off to the side, or, you know, at a designated time and location, if at the job site isn't necessarily the appropriate time, like, hey, you know, like after work, like, how about we grab a bite? I just want to kind of check in with you and see how everything is going, right? So you want to build that camaraderie. And I think it's really important to build a sense of community early on so that people do feel comfortable to have conversations when things come up. Great question. Thank you. And then we do have another question. I know um, you've been mentioning a lot of the resources and we saw them through the videos, but I do see here, um, can you explain a little bit of what happens if someone were to call um, the 988 crisis lifeline? Absolutely. So oftentimes when individuals call into the crisis line, um, they often ask like your name, they've asked for general, like basic demographics, name, location, age. Um, they may ask you, you know, are you experiencing a mental health or psychological emergency? You know, what's currently happening? They may create a safety plan with you. They may offer you additional resources. Um, they'll talk you through, right? And I think the most important thing is that they're going to provide support, right? So they will ask you some general basic questions, but they'll also ask you to kind of talk to me about what's going on, right? Why, what's happening right now that, you know, motivated you to reach out to, you know, 988, the crisis line? How can we be of support to you? Here are some resources. This is what our recommendations are. So that's kind of how the flow of the conversation will go. Okay, thank you. And we do have another question. How do you help without overstepping? As you know, a therapist is trained in handling these uh, situations. Where does one alert um, for the resources? Absolutely. So I always think like knowing your own personal boundaries, right? And so I often think when you're offering a resource, you can, you can ask, you know, follow up with that person. Like, so say, for example, someone came to you and they're like, you know, I'm just not feeling my best. They're not necessarily suicidal, but you've noticed that they're just feeling down and a little bit depressed or overly anxious. You're like, you know, how can I support you? I think that's the largest question that people can ask. Like, how can I support you? Because oftentimes we just assume like, oh, people will just figure it out on their own. But really sometimes we need that additional support. And so asking that question, you know, I've noticed that your mood has shifted, you know, is there something that I can do to help support you? You know, can we talk about it? Do you want to get together? And so really allowing that there to be a bridge. Um, and then you can say like, these are some resources. This is what I've tried, right? Self-disclosure is okay in those situations. If you feel comfortable, like I've gone to therapy, I've done, you know, X, Y, and Z, but I felt that way to provide maybe some context, but also a moment of hope, right? Like when I'm stressed, I meditate or when I'm stressed, I journal or listen to music. Have you considered those things, right? And so you want to make it conversational, but always coming from a place of support, love, and I'm here because I care about you. I think when that comes across, people are mo more open to being open with you. Thank you. And then I do also see here another question. Um, what can we do to close um, the suicide gaps among the LGBTQIA plus community, veterans, and people living with disabilities? Oh, absolutely. Great questions. Um, I think the biggest thing within like, the LGBTQ veterans and even individual dis disabilities, it's really a place of acceptance and belonging. I think oftentimes when you are in those sort of minority status groups, people are feeling isolated or judged. I think if we can come from a place of, I want to understand it, because maybe you don't understand, maybe you haven't had that experience. Maybe you're not a part of the LGBTQIA community. Find out more information about the community, create relationships, ask questions. I think, you know, when you don't know something, it is okay to ask questions, as long as you're coming from a place of curiosity and wanting to understand. Certainly with veterans, you know, they have behavioral health officers, they have individuals who are constantly trying to do trainings so that that gap gets, 
you know, reduced because it is a high stress job, just like construction, these are high stress industries. And so you earlier on, when, when you first start working at a facility organization, you want to create connections because you want people to know when you're doing well, but you also want people to know when you're not so that people can check in with you. I think when you have that community, you also have that sort of built in support. And so the only way to bridge the gap is if we don't see individuals because of their minority status as different. They can be different and valued, but we also want to make sure that people are accepted and loved and seen for who they are, regardless of how they identify. Thank you. And then um, lastly, can you elaborate on what like workplaces can do to reduce, prevent suicide, or even as you were mentioning those, uh, you know, creating a safe place, mm -hmm. um, what can be done in the work settings? You know, I think in the work setting, we can really do some community building um, earlier on. If you can have like a work retreat, something that sort of allows people to understand who one another are at a personal level, not just professional. I think when people feel like a company or agency is invested in them, they're more likely to invest in the company and agency and organization. And so taking time to really encourage personal development outside of work, professional development, community engagement. And so having events, right? Whether it's monthly or quarterly, so that people are really coming together and building that sense of community and that sense of belonging, right? And so I think oftentimes there can be trainings, but more than just a training, I think really having, you know, organized lunches. A lot can happen sitting around a table with food and just engaging one-on-one, -on -one. remembering the humanity of a person, I think is really important. In order to do that, we have to connect sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, but also in larger groups. And so I think organizations can really be intentional about how do we schedule our meetings? Do we take 15 minutes to just do a check-in, right? Can I take five minutes at the end to say like, how's everyone really doing? How's everyone processing? What's kind of going on, right? So it doesn't have to be just like one event. It can be on a weekly basis, a monthly basis of just a check-in, like, how are you? I think sometimes people ask the question, how are you doing? But they don't always listen to the answer or they don't always you know, give the answer that's accurate or authentic, they just say good. And so I think when you really ask someone, how are you doing, wait for that response and engage in a conversation. So I think our companies can do a little bit more of that in the beginning, but also throughout the year. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Buffalo. Um, that was the end of our questions um, for today. And so really want to just thank everyone in the audience that were asking questions. Uh, you know, this is really one of the parts that I think is the most engaging when everyone kind of asks the questions that they've been anticipating <laughs> for our Absolutely. Before. And then also, uh, again, thank you, Dr. Buffalo, for providing some answers. Thank you for the questions. And so I just want to take a moment to really thank everyone for your attention and your time. Once again, I'm Dr. Nikisha Buffalo. I'm a psychological counselor and clinician here at Dominguez Hills and their student psychological services. Also, all of the information that was provided today is in our references. So if you want additional information, please visit either the American Psychological Association, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Alliance for Mental Health Illness, the National Institute of Mental Health, as well as Substance Abuse, and Mental Health Service Administration. Thank you, Dr. Buffalo and uh, Josephine for providing this uh, valuable information. And also thank you for the audience for participating. The topic presented today is just uh, as relevant as uh, relevant and serious as other workplace hazards. And, and it does require awareness and proper training to mitigate the risks. Um, as an OSHA Education Center, not only are we tasked with the responsibility of educating employees, employers, and safety professionals, uh, but we also support OSHA's mission through uh, webinars such as this uh, and other events to uh, raise awareness of important topics.
So on our website, you will find program information, uh, course schedule, and steps to register for classes. If you have any other questions about our program, feel free to email us at OSHA at csudh.edu, or you can call us at 310-243-2425. This concludes our OSHA presentation on workplace suicide prevention awareness. Uh, we wanna thank you for joining us today. We have covered a great deal of information and discussed import, important resources available to you. Uh, for details covering this session, feel free to download uh, the OSHA Training Institute Education Center Program Kit at bit.ly slash csudh-osha-infokit. We have provided a link to, in the chat for those of you who are participating live, and this information will also be available on our website. The recording for this session will also be online shortly uh, on our website and social media. Feel free to stay connected with us by visiting our website and social media at Facebook page and also the uh, LinkedIn group to uh, receive regular updates and information about our courses, safety events, uh, our quarterly update. Uh, feel free to join our website, our newsletter uh, by visiting our website. We'll stay in the session a few minutes just in case anybody needs to copy uh, any of the information that we've posted on, on the chat. Um, also, we'd like, to, we'd like to get your uh, feedback on this session. So please let us know how we can improve the quality of this webinar uh, by visiting, uh, again, uh, bit.ly uh, forward slash at csudh dash webinar dash feedback. And when you are ready to leave the session, simply uh, click on the red button on the corner of your screen. Once again, thank you for joining us. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.